now they're teaching yep. fully indoctrinating our children into hating other people because our children now are being abused to the extent that they don't they don't cherish all of God's creation. Part of the creation, if it just happens to have a lighter paying job than me, uh, that that part of it, no, we can. They're they're oppressors, they're victimizers. We can neglect them because they're they abuse us. You you didn't get abused over 200 some odd years ago. Good morning, Joyful Warriors. We are joined right now by Kevin McGarry, and Kevin is the founder of Every Black Life Matters. He also, he also wrote this book, Woked Up, finally putting an ax to the taproot of white supremacy and racism in America. Kevin, welcome to the Joyful Warriors podcast. We're so happy to have you today to talk a little bit about where we are in this country. And our mission statement at Moms for Liberty is to unify, educate, and empower parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government. But our moms are very concerned because it seems like our children are being divided in school every single day. Every so day. I'm really happy that you're here to talk about your organization. Um, give us a, a little background about you first, if you could. Uh, Absolutely. Tell us about your, your where, how you've come to, to be here today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Tiffany. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just thank God for you and this, you and uh, Tina and your wonderful organization, because we need more parent involvement, because literally our children, by and large, throughout the public school system are being abused every day, like you're saying. They're either being abused physically by bullies or they're being abused by the system, being perverted by, uh, or, 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 or taught dysphoria of all types. And so Moms for Liberty is just so, such a wonderful organization. <laughs> and I'm really honored and privileged to be here. So thank you for having me. Uh, so a little bit about me. So um, I've, again, I'm the co-founder of Every Black Life Matters. And, uh, but, you know, really I started in San Francisco. So I was born in the 1960s in the Hunter's Point Project Housing in San Francisco. Now, if anybody knows about San Francisco, you know that's where literally the Black Panther Party started. So I was a boy from the hood, man. I was a bad boy. Uh, did all kinds of craziness. But, you know, by God's grace, I'm here today. So, so uh, and then I went to San Jose State, got a sociology degree and uh, things like that. Got married early. And uh, my wife and now, my wife and I have now been married 36 years. That is awesome. And uh, uh, the reality is, is we started to see the breakdown of communities. Uh, we started to see the breakdown, particularly of the black community, uh, by virtue of abortuaries uh, like Planned Parenthood that were specifically targeting black life. And uh, and we started to see the uh, degradation, if you will, of of learning. Uh, of, of uh, learning in inner city communities. And we said, you know, we were both, she was born in inner city Detroit, so, and she's a psychology major, uh, psychology degree. So we, we said, you know, we, we've been voting this way all of our lives, but we see that there is a real breakdown with how we were voting, which was all liberal, progressive leftist. It doesn't address the issues of the communities that we hold dear. It doesn't address the faith issues of our moral faith and moral foundation. So we said, look, we need to look at the party platforms. And when we did, we were just uh, blown away because um, the reality is, is that we had been uh, adopting and encouraging and supporting uh, a, a party that didn't reflect our wow. faith and it didn't reflect our community and it doesn't reflect our family. And so we made a switch and that was Reagan's second term. So uh, so anyway, so we saw the carnage a couple years ago of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we saw them with their white supremacist uh, Antifa, who were, there was a study done, they were all born in suburbia, they're all white, pretty much, and uh, yet they were coming to the black community to burn down black and brown businesses. So I thought, wow, this is strange. And then uh, my co-founder and all saw that pastors were encouraging parishioners, yeah, go out with BL. So we said... Well, we need, this is crazy. I mean, we have a lot of people of faith who saw the nine minutes and 45 seconds of George Floyd who are sorrowful and grief stricken, but they want a righteous and faithful alternative to, than to the Marxist, violent, hateful BLM. It seems so counterintuitive. Yeah. You watched as small businesses were destroyed oh. and communities were hurt and, and looting and burning and, and, and then business owners left to clean up 
at the the damage, and it really made you stop as Americans and say, we are hurting each other so much in this country. Devastating. It's devastating. It is devastating. And so we started every Black Life Matters. And what, what we stand for is everything that BLM doesn't. So we just, honestly, we went to the BLM website. Yeah, you get to look at the tenets and, we said, and you look, did the we're opposite. Gonna be everything what is it? That they're what is it that, what, there's like this so, bracelet, what would Jesus do? It's it, You have one that should be like, what would BLM do? And we're going to do the opposite we're do of the that. Opposite. Okay. We went to the opposite. We went to the website. And at that time, they still had up there that they were anti nuclear family, yes. anti father, anti man. Um, They've so, scrubbed that now. Yeah, they scrubbed it. Oh, yeah. They, they, but they, they had a tenant that said the destruction of the nuclear family. Absolutely, they yeah. did. Absolutely. Directly on their website. So we went there and we said, look, we're going to stand for black life from the womb to the tomb, from conception to the grave. Uh, because when Margaret Sanger said that I want to thoroughly exterminate the Negro population, she didn't, and this is the founder of Planned Parenthood, of course, she didn't make a distinction, I want to destroy blacks and Hispanics or blacks. And she said blacks. So the reality is, is blacks are being born at this level and all other ethnicities are being born at this level, even though we're such a small percentage of the population. So uh, there's strategic targeting of black babies in the womb uh, that now has blacks, even as a small percentage of the population, making up over 40% of all abortions. Wow. And so, and so we wanted to address that. So if you look at our name, some people will say, why didn't you call yourselves every, every life matter, all lives matter? And that's what we're saying. All lives, every life matter. All so stop targeting the black community so we can at least be born at the same rate that everyone else is, at the very least. But uh, more importantly, this is a life, and uh, we need to be sincere about protecting life. This is God's precious creation. So uh, for us, it was uh, that that's that's why we named ourselves Every Black Life Matters because all lives matter and every life matters. And every, God sees all life as precious, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. so we've learned a little bit about why your organization was founded as a kind of a, a response to this BLM movement. Um, it's been interesting to see the changes that have happened across this country since Black oh. Lives Matter rose up, and then to see the corruption within the Black Lives Matter movement itself, with so much money donated to this cause, but then to see a lot of mismanagement and a lot of questions about how that money was used. I feel like, unfortunately, marginalized communities in this country often deal with money that's meant for those services being hijacked or not really being used for the people. Uh, I feel that way about the teachers' unions and the teachers, oh, absolutely. for the record. And so... Let's talk a little bit about the pivot. Um, yeah. You know, I have a, a friend, James Lindsay, who does a podcast, New Discourses, and James will often say that the left is now looking for what they call, he calls a drag Floyd moment. Yeah. Uh, George Floyd's death was tragic, but it was used as a pivot point in this country to push us into this Marxist way of thinking Huge. to really, and so let's just talk a little bit about, because I think it's hard for our moms to really always understand, like, why is this happening, right? right. What is the ultimate goal right. here? Um, talk to us a little bit about that shift that happened when yes. George Floyd was killed and then how it was kind of used. Yes, absolutely. So what the uh, revolutionary Marxists use, and, and again, BLM, they all self-identify as radical revolutionary Marxists. Like I the mean, American Library Association absolutely. as well now, just they, for the record. They just, yeah. they, and so uh, what that means is that if we try to view their actions or their principles from a, a rational, logical perspective, we'll drive ourselves crazy. Right. So take that off the table. So don't you, try to understand them. Don't try to understand. <laughs> only try Got to it. understand it from the perspective of a Marxist revolutionary. Which is, everything is broken. Exactly. So, so in this book, Woke Up, what I do is I completely disintermediate all the existing, you know, how, how the woke movement is made up. So, and this covers it completely. So I'm glad we're sort of pivoting to this because this sure. gets to your question. Um, first of all, I want to say, though, from George Floyd, we had CRT, DEI, and ESG. These are all Marxist schemes, okay? to get us out of the normative, the traditional. Now, so I'll say that and then I'll give you a little bit of background about how we arrived here. Great. Right. So here's the thing. When I started to write the book, all my books come through divine revelation. That may sound spooky to some people, but I don't know. I'm just a brother from the hood. This is my fifth book. And it's just, 
I don't get writer's block because it's a divine revelation. It's coming right? out, yeah, it's just coming through you. And all my books have been written in ten weeks, wow. complete with with research and everything. When <laughs> you, you need read to come this book, and help us do that. <laughs> yeah, when you read this book, you'll see that that brother I was I was interviewing, he's pretty plain spoken. This is unbelievable, yeah, because it's the anyway. Um, I think you're great. So, <laughs> so, 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 so here's the thing. So it was coming, and I thought, okay, the Lord has a, a writing assignment for me. Okay, I opened up my laptop and I started writing. I said, okay, I got, I need to start with Marks, and I felt that still small voice said, no, 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 no. Marks had a mentor. You start with him. So who was Marks's mentor? I go to Marks and Engels, their early writings, and who they dedicated it to. Charles Robert Darwin. So I go to Darwin's work and I take a look at his first book on natural selection for the preservation of most favored races. And I'm thinking, wow, how come I never knew that? I mean, you know, favored races. The first time in human history that a well-known, renowned scientist makes a race classification distinction. Wow. It didn't exist before Darwin said, this is what. So, so I started with Darwin. His second book on the descent of man, Darwin goes into detail on what the favored races are. He says, look, we whites, white European Caucasians, we fully uh, uh, plateaued at first because, we, you know, again, Darwin's evolutionary theory is all ethnicities evolved differently right. because there, there is no God, according to Darwin. Right. And, and so, therefore, you had these races that evolved differently. He says, we whites, we've plateaued. We're, you know, we have intellectual capacity. We have all the resources. On the other hand, you look at these other ethnicities. Oh, and especially the blacks. Blacks are still trying to climb the evolutionary scale. He says, they're the perfect example of my evolutionary theory. They're subhuman, gorillas, apes, and savages. All Darwin's exact words from the descent of man. He also doubled down on sexism and misogyny. He says, look, I've done all of the research with women. So all you women. And, and I've taken yeah, a look at the- You know us, we're not that bright. Yeah. yeah and, you know, just well, this is, this is what- It's a rough go for the women these Yeah, days. all you women, take a, take a look at what Darwin said about you. He says, look, I've, taken, I've done the cranial cavity studies, and the, the cranial cavity for women is much smaller than that of men. Therefore, their intellectual capacity is much, much less. <laughs> so from that point on, women were relegated. The reason why we had women's suffrage movements with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Frederick Douglass is because men completely dismissed them and said, no, you guys don't have the capacity to even be able to vote. No, no, no. This is what happened, okay? So after Darwin... Uh, then uh, during, well, the other part of Darwin's uh, thing, and I know you have a lot of women, some that would self-identify as being pro-choice, um, you know, women's right to choose. Okay, okay, listen to the history. Darwin and his first cousin, Francis Galton, were concerned about the reproductive patterns of other ethnicities. Francis Galton was a world-class uh, statistician. He was a pioneer of modern-day statistics, so he was brilliant. He said, look, uh, to his older cousin Charles, he said, look, I've done the uh, research and all of these other ethnicities are populating at a much greater rate than we are. Therefore, we need to come up with a way to stem their uh, population growth. Other, uh, otherwise, we're going to, you know, whites, European, Caucasians, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, in, in, you know, uh, less. We're, we're gonna, there's going to be intermarriage, intermingling, and we're going to disappear. This is their fatalistic point of view. So they concocted a scheme called eugenics. Eugenics means well-born, okay? So bear with me, I'm, I'm trying to get through. You're to what, good, we're listening, yeah, I'm listening. So this is great Eugenics means well-born. So here's the thing, white supremacists, because they said we're supreme, we already, and, uh, and, and, and racists, because they said blacks are subhuman, apes and savages. They said, look, we need to stop other ethnicities, all other ethnicities, to protect our lineage, right? So, uh, so they concocted eugenics, means well-born, and they said, basically, if you're not well-born, in other words, if you're not white, Caucasian, European, uh, you can be summarily exterminated. So uh, if you want to understand the justification for Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, all of them, and I, I connect all the dots here, they say, no, 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 we can do this, we can exterminate all these people. Uh, Darwin said we can get rid of the uh, people that are not you know, well-born. And so this is where eugenics went, okay? And it's, so all of the mass genocidal despots used eugenics as justification to exterminate their masses. Now, when it came to America, we did, you know, forced sterilization of black women. Uh, everybody should know that in the 60s and 70s. Um, and then uh, Planned Parenthood, right, by abortion. So the reality is, if you are pro-choice, woman's right to choose, that's fine, you could be that. 
But the reality is, if you are that, because of the theories, the only reason why we have abortion, the only reason, is out of white supremacy and racism. Wow. The fathers of eugenics, Charles Darwin and Francis Galton, this is why they did it. So, so if you're a pro, you know, a pro-choice, woman's right to choose, fine. Just own it, though. Just say, look, I'm a pro-choice, pro woman's right to choose, and I am a white supremacist and racist, because that's what you are. I mean, that's the only reason why we have it. That, but what a fascinating trick that has been played on America, yeah. right? And so we're watching now as Planned Parenthood finds their ways into our America's public schools in an ever-increasing way with comprehensive sex education and with the help of the CDC. And we see an expansion of community schools yes. and we see informed consent laws being lowered to the age of 12. So you've got kids who are 12 years old. I've got four kids. I have a 12-year-old that would eat a pack of Oreos a day if I let them. Oh, right, so, right. you know, I, I don't think he really... It has the capacity to be able to make medical decisions for himself. Right. But here we have children in these schools, and Planned Parenthood is all too ready to come in, aren't they? Absolutely, and, and they are. And to, you know, counsel our kids and, and to basically say, no, parent, you don't need to be involved. We'll take care of everything. The government is doing that. What does a future look like with parents even more disengaged than they are right now as far as education and their kids are concerned in America? I have a Wonderful. real concern about Wonderful. that. It's, it's a huge concern, but because of your... Uh, esteemed and astute organization who get who's at the tip of the spear to help women really figure out the best learning environments for their children. Uh, I do have hope. So we have a lot of homeschool networks now that are cropping up all over the place. We have teachers that have left the propagandist mills within public schools, and they're making themselves available for learning pods and other types of learning yeah. situations. These are things that we should applaud. I encourage everybody. Now, I know some public schools are still great, but I encourage everybody, look, if your child is in public school and if you have the capacity, please take them out because it's child abuse. But you and I both know yeah. that uh, that's not a reality for a lot of Americans. Right. Um, we have a lot of single moms that are members Huge. of our organization. They're struggling to be able to put food on the table. Yes. Um, and public schools really failed them. I mean, first they shut down, right? And so it was something that was a part of our lives that shut down. But then also to find out that the betrayal of trust, what's happening behind closed doors. And religion is oftentimes being weaponized with parents. Secrets are being kept from parents about exactly right. children because they're saying, well, you, we heard, you know, we know that you're Catholic exactly or, right. you know, we know that you're Jewish and you're not going to, you know, be okay with, with the things that, you know, we're trying to support your child with. So exactly this idea right. that the government knows better than the child. I want to talk to you. Uh, about critical race theory. Yes. Um, so our moms have been very, very concerned that our children are being divided in school, exactly that right. uh, they're being told that uh, white people are bad um, and inherently bad with original sin that they can never take away, right. um, even though many of the children in the classroom have uh, no history or experience That's with right. slavery in any capacity. In any capacity. Um, and so... Um, but kids are, are coming home and saying there was a child in Tennessee who has a white father and a Thai mother. And he said, I don't want anyone to know that um, daddy's white. Yeah. Um, it, it, so we have, a, I mean, I grew up in the 80s. Yeah. <clears throat> I was born in 79. I'm 43 now. When I was being raised, I, and I think about like the 90s, I graduated high school, you could date who you wanted. We, I was told, date who you want, marry who you want. We were living in a time, and a lot of us did. We married outside of our race or outside of our religion, and right. we had children Absolutely. with people from a different race or religion. And now we have a nation of a lot of biracial children Lots. in schools, and yet this, this toxicity... Yes. Telling them half of them is good and half of them is bad. How do we move forward as a country? Because kids don't see race. Yeah. They just don't. They don't. Um, and and um, um, Ruby Bridges has been quoted as saying it, it is adults that keep racism alive. Yes. That we are the ones that are perpetuating this in this country. And so how do we save our kids from this? Excellent. Excellent. Let me help with this. So, so we actually do workshops around the country with concerned parents and communities. Uh, anti-CRT, anti-liberation theology, black liberation theology, and a social justice versus biblical justice kind of thing that we do. Uh, so we've been doing that for the past couple of years since we started. So here's the deal. Um, I, I'm so glad you asked that question because the reality is, is that when we teach children with CRT infused, this is not 
you know. The, I the, think of it as the glasses. It's like right. putting on the CRT glasses. Right. And now I'm going to teach this lesson from a different perspective. It, it, it is infused with critical race theory. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason why we were showing up at school boards and they were saying, oh, get out of here. We're not teaching. It, it, according to, you know, actual definition, they were right. It's it's, it's not the it's graduate really, level course. It's not the graduate critical, level right, course. Right, right, exactly. I got it. I got so, it. So, so, but they are teaching it throughout stories, okay, and examples. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, what that teaches our children who are innocent is to hate other people. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't even hate is It's not something that I can even touch, right? It's not even something that, because my emotional makeup is, I don't even know what that's like, right? But most people who do hate, they learn that over time, mostly when they're young adults or older adults. They're not, as, as children, you don't they're know born how to, to hate. Now they're teaching, yep. fully indoctrinating our children into hating other people. So this is what's so destructive and insidious about it, right? Because our children now are being abused to the extent that they don't, they don't cherish all of God's creation. Part of the creation, if it just happens to have a lighter paint job than me, uh, that, that part of it, no, we can, they're, they're oppressors, they're victimizers, we can neglect them because they're, they abuse us. You, you didn't get abused, it was over 200 some odd years ago. But here's, here's the other thing about this. Now again, if we look at it from a rational lens, we missed the point. This is part of Marxist, uh, yeah. you know. So, so we had four individuals escape Hitler's Germany to come here to America in the early 70s or late 60s. And they set up shop at Columbia University and started the Frankfurt School. Uh, from there, they started all of the critical uh, theory stuff uh, with all these different factions within critical theory. Critical race theory came out of that. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, Marx said, we must, in order to succeed with my Marxist revolutionary, we must take every existing hegemonic uh, traditional uh, paradigm and completely turn it upside down. So when you think about Sounds it- Sounds a little bit like Mao's cultural revolution. It does, right? it the is. Destroy the four olds, Absolutely. right? Okay. Absolutely. So, so when you think of it from that perspective, that they're not trying to make a rational, logical uh, argument. They're not they're building just, anything. No, they're just trying to turn it upside down and completely destroy it. Now, the other thing that we hear now is, well, what are you so concerned about? We're just teaching your children accurate history. Uh, no, 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 you're not. Here's why. I read Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. I read Ken she Ibram. She sounds Ex very fragile. Well, she yeah, does. She is, she is she, very yeah, fragile. right. Yeah. And I've read Kendi's book on anti-racism. Because here's the thing: they talk a lot about systemic racism. They talk a lot about slavery, but they never, just like no school boards will, ever point to the actual faction that did the harms. And there's a reason why. Because they'd have and to own it. They'd have to own it now, but that particular faction they belong to today. Yeah. Right? So, so it, it, your moms know who that is. I don't, I don't want to get political, but I'm just saying, uh, all white people didn't enslave blacks. It's no. a, it's a, we had a civil war. So who were... Who, who were at, Based on the founding principles of our country, based on the which we principles. said, which we recognized. I mean, that's the thing I think that gets lost, and that is such a shame that we don't teach yeah. our children the fact that the, the founding principles of our country were so good, and we didn't always live up to them. But I think we have evolved as Americans to work to say we need to do better. Women have to have a place in society yeah. and have to vote. You know, and, and then you have feminism come in and try to tell us that somehow when you become a mother, you, you become less than to try to bring us down again, in my opinion. Yes. And we had to have civil rights movement yes. and have black Americans have the right to vote and to be able to live as, as human beings together with each other. Right. All of these things were so incredibly important and were and, and beautiful. And beautiful. I mean, the, I was on a Twitter space yeah. the other night and somebody was saying something about um, all, the, all the different, that, that it's going to be, they were talking about reparations. And they said, well, it's going to be really difficult because um, so many people have intermarried. And I was like, we should be clapping. Yes. We should be celebrating the fact that so many people have married each other that it would be difficult to unravel our history because it's beautiful. It's absolutely that beautiful. That we found a new way to be in America together. It's a our founding special fathers, country. our founding fathers, our framers, they were God, they were divinely inspired. They wrote those words in there that that all humans are created equal by his creator and that we're all the same. That's what was, again, the genesis of what set people like my, you know, my people, ethnicity free, right? Yeah. So you had people in the North who embraced that. You had people in the South that decried it and fought against it. That was a civil war. That faction of people, by the way, 
is still around today. Those are the people that are that are talking about reparations. And so what I say you to those- You can say Democrats. I mean, I think we need to be honest about some of this because we actually have, a, our, our membership is interesting. Yeah. Um, we're a nonpartisan organization, yeah. but a lot of our moms during COVID saw Democrat leaders yeah. who they thought stood for the things and valued the same things that they valued, and they realized they didn't. They didn't. No, and and there was a real disconnect and an awakening, which gives great possibility for the future in our country. So it's okay to say, I mean, okay. I feel I'll, like I'll say, I'm still Democrat. waiting for the Democrats to stand up and, and own parental rights, because yes. there are some Democrat parents, too, and I'm sure they have a line exactly. somewhere, so, right? So again, all of the authors, the school boards, whenever we show up, ask them, and when they say, oh, we just want to teach your children accurate history, that's where it teaches here. You, you say, uh, so you want to teach accurate history. Now, who again actually enslaved, lynched, murdered, raped uh, all of the blacks during the 1800s? Who was that? Can you tell me who is that? Because the kids want to know who actually did that. It's not all white people. Who, who, who was it? We need to force them to say, uh, we did it. We Democrats did it. Yeah, we messed them up. That's what we need. But they'll never say that, right? Well, no, because they'd have to own the harm. It's like the, the teachers' unions. Right. If they acknowledge the, the massive educational failure, and, I, yeah. and that's where I'd like, like to end with you. I really do want to talk about the kids Yes. And, and the rampant educational failure. So I'll tell you, I served on a school board in Florida um, and, and came into a situation uh, where I, I went. They had something called the African American Achievement Committee. This district that I served in was still under a desegregation order. Still under wow. a deseg order. The NAACP does not want to wow. end that desegregation order. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, they, they have no interest in my community of ending it. And I think it's because in other communities where they've come into compliance and they have found come to unitary status, um, that the, the NAACP has lost their power. It, it, yes. And so in my own community, I have watched as the leadership has have, have wanted to keep it ongoing, even as we've made efforts through the federal court system to try to reach unitary status to say, you know, I said, well, let's go through. And if we can, if we're in compliance with the buildings, right? If we're in, let's get that off the table and let's focus on student achievement. Yes. But we're not focusing on student achievement, but we need to yes. because there is an achievement gap in this country. Huge. Huge. And it is not because black students cannot learn to read yeah. or to That's write garbage. or to do math. That yes. is garbage. Yes. And, so, and it's racist and demeaning. And it is racist yeah. and demeaning. And, and we should be expecting more from every child to every have child. different expectations for a child to, based on the color of their skin no. it is racist. disgusting yeah, and it racist. Is. Yeah. But I saw a system that was very much interested in protecting itself. And I walked into this achievement committee meeting and no minutes were being taken. Uh, there was no agenda. They didn't have any supporting documents. Wow. And uh, the, how they were closing the achievement gap was a $500 stipend to a multi multicultural coordinator to basically have a Martin Luther King Day parade float. That was the extent. And I walked in that room, and I'll tell you, as a school board member, and I said, wow. I still remember, I said, if I was the mother of a black child, yeah. I would be, I, I'm angry right now, yeah. but all of the moms should see the ridiculous farce ridiculous. of a committee this is. That is. That's horrible. But it was run by a black woman in the community who had reached a, a pinnacle in her career that I just kept saying, how are you... And, and the minute I questioned her, I became You're the racist. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Even though I was there talking for the kids. And so I've just watched as some organizations or associations continue to stand up for the adults. Yes. But not for the kids. And not the kids, at all for the kids. They're not okay. Yeah. Our kids... Uh, so uh, something else that you said, and I, I know you're trying to end this up, but I want everybody, all of your listeners, all your moms across America to understand something. We are all in a multi-ethnic reality. If you checked your ancestry, and I checked mine, it's, it's all, I don't, you know, Angela Davis checked yeah, hers this week. Yeah, I saw week. that. <laughs> and she had, and a, she, yeah. she had a lily white somebody on the uh, Mayflower. Mayflower come out as part I of her it. She ancestry. She was like, I don't believe it. I was like, oh, Angela, it's, it's, you better own believe Own up it. to it, girl. Yeah. Come on now. That was it. Yeah. So the reality is, is we're all in this, man. I mean, you know, come on. So I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. right? And we should applaud that. But, but with the separation... Uh, mainly what they're doing now is they're keeping black and brown children handcuffed to the public school system because that's they, that need, they need the money. And this is where all, everything gets messed up because the Teachers Association is the largest lobby 
from what I understand, from a money perspective and support perspective into and I just uh, what's found happening out, in our government. I just found out like 15% of the DNC delegates are members of the See? teachers union. They are they are they're running huge. the show when yeah, it comes to our schools show. and our country too. And so you just keep asking yourself, where do we go from here? Homeschool networks, uh, learning pods, all of the wonderful initiatives that you guys do here. Uh, this is an organization that needs to be supported uh, and is Fortunately, you guys are doing well, and I applaud you for that. Thank you so uh, much. This is a time in the season where we need organizations like this at the tip of the spear in education to really help propel us forward and have alternate methodologies for mothers, concerned mothers across the country uh, who are just trying to look out for their children. Uh, if we don't do something different, our children would grow up to be radical revolutionaries, uh, relatively brain dead in the sense that they won't have essential life skills to actually compete against, you know, within and against others in, in really notable industries. And so this is the time where we have to take the bull by the horns, yeah. make sure that our children uh, get the kind of education based on their own learning style, whether it's a, a homeschool network, charter school, whatever, private school. Um, but we have all kinds of different methodologies and schooling out there. The only thing that I believe is absolutely obsolete is the cookie cutter approach in the public school system that harms our children every single day when they show up by forcing them to hate other people, by forcing them to- Hate our country. Kind of, well, hate our country, by forcing them to doubt or kind of think about twice about their own gender identity. This kind of stuff for children, it's ridiculous. Yep. It, it, you know, and so uh, we've got to get better about this and as sooner we can actually collapse the public school system, uh, in some way uh, by We're going to reform it. We're going to reclaim it. and reform yes. it. I there mean, that's go. why we're running that's for school board. Yes. You know, getting good people that on these school boards, liberty-minded individuals right. that really respect the role of parents and know that every child, 95% of kids can learn to read. Absolutely. You know, only 32% of kids in our schools are, are actually proficient in reading in fourth grade. It is... Uh, that's abysmal. It is, it is, yeah. it is horrible. Yeah. It is the biggest threat to national security it that is. we have in our country. I continue to say that there are a lot of things that we can do. There are a lot of issues to address, but if we do not address our failing public education system, we will have a generation uh, and many generations of children who cannot read, who cannot write, who cannot do math, and, and will not uh, have a successful life where they can be independent. Yeah. And, and think for themselves. So I'm um, so appreciative of you coming on oh, the show to talk about Every Black here. Life Matters and woke up Kevin McGarry. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you your time. Me. God thank bless you, you Tiffany. Thank, thank you. you.